And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. Longtime ABC radio host Paul Harvey used those words to open a broadcast in 1978. Over the last half century, America has struggled to form a plan for how best to protect God's planned paradise. And farmers have been asked to carry the load. Well, in the last two decades, more than 100,000 small farms have disappeared across America's landscape. There is not a minute where a farmer doesn't feel stress. The last 20 years have been terrible. Oh, you gotta be great big or you just as well for you. Farmer suicide rates spiked 40% in less than two decades. I had no clue that he was to that point. Since 2010, the rates of mental health issues in the agriculture industry have risen steadily. As of 2017, workers in the farming industry were three and a half times more likely to die by suicide than a member of the general population. This podcast, The Growing Season, will follow six Arkansas farmers through a year on their land, hearing them through their wins and losses, seeing them through bounty and bust, and working to understand the stress and struggle that comes with this way of life. In this first episode, we'll meet cattle, row crop, vegetable, and organic farmers to discuss how they got into the work and just what it is that keeps them coming back season after season. At the end of this episode, we'll sit down with Arkansas Secretary of Agriculture, Wes Ward, to discuss the state of farming in Arkansas, as well as the growing farming pressures brought on by falling commodity prices, higher input costs, and an increasingly volatile climate. I'm Ben Dickey. I'm an actor and a musician born and raised in Arkansas. My grandparents farmed in Arkansas for decades. My wife and I once tried our hand at growing vegetables on a cotton farm in northern Louisiana. And let me tell you, friends, we got humbled. It's a full-time, all-time gig. I'm very excited to help share the stories of these hard-working Arkansans. Join us as we turn an overdue caring eye to the caretakers on the growing season. Our stories begin along with the Arkansas growing season in March. Some farmers across the state are fending off the last of Arkansas's winter weather. But on Heifer Ranch in Perryville, the sun is bright and warm. Here's producer Hillary Trudell. Driving from Little Rock to Perryville to visit Donna Kilpatrick, the land steward at Heifer Ranch, you can't help but be struck by the beauty of the flat land of Pulaski County, slowly giving way to the rolling hills of bright green. There's something about being on the land. And I've gone through various ebbs and flows in my farming career of really like liking to work with pigs or, uh, or working with cows. Cows are by far my favorite species. But really, it's the land that I'm most drawn to. And I can't really explain like what it is about this place that feels so incredibly special and sacred to me. But there's nothing like starting your day off before the sunrise or as the sun rises with coffee and your dog out in the middle of a pasture. This feeling of awe is something Donna feels every day. Donna has spent a lifetime choosing the land, a choice that has brought her here to Perryville, Arkansas to manage the almost 1,200 acres at Heifer Ranch. Donna is open, affable, and a great storyteller. She is at home in this place, and the joy it brings her is palpable. This is a real example of someone who has found joy in their work. Uh, was working at Hampshire College in uh, Massachusetts in their admissions, and I saw the position for Heifer Farm and really wanted to get back to what I loved. When the position came open, um, I jumped on it, even though it was a radical pay reduction. The main focus at Heifer Ranch is livestock, many of which we see. Pigs, chickens, and Donna's favorite, cows. And no introduction to farm life would be complete without some exploration of, that's right, manure. So mind-blowing. Like, if you turn around and you look, so that's where the chickens were last year. So do you see the strips of green? 
Mm -hmm. And when I was talking about the benefits and the positive impact that the livestock leave behind, you can see the chicken litter. So the chickens, there are about 500 chickens can live in one of those, we call them schooners, prairie schooners. We move them forward every single day and you can see the benefits that they leave behind by comparing this backfield here to the one where, so this year we're focusing on that area and you can see that. As always, the work at Heifer is ongoing. Donna and the team have big plans. While there's a lot of work at hand, Donna already has some ideas of what she wants her year to look like and the possible challenges that lay ahead. What are those nine months, like what is the ideal of those nine months gonna look like for you and Heifer? All of our enterprises, the animals that were allocated from grassroots are gonna be happy and healthy and grow to their, you know, ideal weights and um, leave great droppings for us on the pastures, which helps the pastures flourish. We're gonna train a lot of farmers. Um, we're starting, I don't know, we haven't really talked about this, but we're really uh, starting to train people in ecological outcomes. So we've recently become a savory hub. Um, so with the Savory Institute, which is um, uh, a, an organization that helps restore grasslands. Um, Donna is incredibly passionate about her work, but she has to keep an eye on how the demands of the ranch affect the other parts of her life. How does your wife like living out here? It is. Um, it is. And I actually, I mean, there are parts of it, the conversation or the topic that I absolutely agree with her on. Like, we're extremely isolated here. Um, we really like, I mean, not that farmers have much time to do anything except farm, but in our free time, being able to go to a really nice restaurant or to a good restaurant, not, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but just get out. We like. We love seeing live music. The nice thing about our relationship is there's lots of give and take. Like it's like okay, we'll work it out. Donna ends our tour by introducing us to her favorite part of the farm. How can you not love a cow? <laughs> Cows are so. They're just majestic and gentle and beautiful and. I feel like they're thoughtful, <laughs> um, the way they move, the way they eat. I love the way they smell. Um, I love their inputs for the land. They drop about 50 pounds of fertilizer out their back end every single day, all of which is incredibly great for the land. They do so many great things. Donna loves cows. Waiting for you, they're all just kind of staring at us. They, they just say, anytime you come in here, they'll come and say hi. And they'll let you pet them? A few. Yeah. It's interesting, not scary, but interesting how curious the cows are about us. As soon as we're through the gate, they start following us. Driving away from Heifer with the sun setting, some bob white quail fly up from the ground. These birds are all close to gone here in Arkansas, but their presence on Heifer Ranch gives one more example of how the farming practices here work in harmony with the land something Donna and her team care deeply about. When we catch back up with Donna in April, we'll hear how a violent spring storm wipes out her much needed vacation and the toll it takes on her health and on her personal life. Managing a fully organic operation is a stressful task but Donna and her team are fortunate to do it with the support of an international organization behind them. However, many smaller farms have to get creative with less acreage and fewer helping hands. For those willing to open up their homes to their customers and communities, agritourism provides a new revenue stream. But this kind of transparency brings new stress to the farm, something Grace and Ruthie Pepler are all too familiar with. Producer Jordan Hickey has the story. On a Saturday afternoon in mid-March, the day at Dogwood Hills Farm, just a few miles outside Marshall, is coming to an end. Ruthie and Grace Pepler, mother and daughter respectively, stand by a fence, plucking palm-sized hunks of green grassy fodder, or barley, out of a black bucket 
tossing them to a handful of cows waiting on the other side of the fence. Asked about how many animals they have, the peplers respond with an informal tally of all the animals on their farm. About 20 cows. Yeah. About counting cows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 16 ish yeah. goats. We just got two more, so it's probably 18. Two sheep, two donkeys, seven dogs, a lemur. Yeah. Um, a bunch of cats. ducks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the ducks and chickens kind of don't necessarily get numbered. <laughs> yeah, chickens right, stay around 40, so they get to live out their life here. So, you know, new spring chicks come on and the old ones pass along. But in the meantime, they get to eat all the bugs and the fodder. As they complete the census, a minivan with Missouri plates rolls up the gravel road beside them and a few small hands wave through the tinted glass. Our guests are heading out for the evening, back up to the guest house. They came down to say goodnight. All the little girls needed to say goodnight to the animals. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's why they came down. That's why they came, yep. yep. Yep, isn't that sweet? Yep, they had to go tell all the baby chicks goodnight. And the one little girl's got them all named. There's a whole bunch of them in there. <laughs> this is because the nature of agriculture that Ruthie and Grace practice at Dogwood Hills Farm is a little different because as Ruthie had said a few minutes before when we were standing in the fodder house, looking at row upon row of hydroponically grown fodder and 13 foot trays bolted to the wall of the former tractor trailer, even though they're focused on squash bugs and goats breaking through fences and the now doubled price of oats, much of their focus lies in sharing the experience with others who might not have had it otherwise. Watching a kid squirt a squirt of warm milk and be surprised never gets old. Every single time, you're just like, oh my goodness, that's so sweet. Or when they reach in and they find out that the eggs are warm as they're taking them out from underneath the hen, and then they want that specific egg, make sure it's this one for breakfast the next morning, you know? And uh, that's, you know, that's the pleasure for us, but I think it's also the why. But it hasn't always been this way. It wasn't even supposed to be this way. But things grow, things change, and the farm adapts. A 4 H project when Grace was 12 became the fodder house and Grace's growing dairy. An ice storm in 2009 started their potlucks and provided much of the bonds and relationships that now support their community. Even the farm and the family's involvement in agritourism had an unlikely but auspicious beginning, going back to when the Peplers moved to Coza home from New Jersey in 2007 and started hosting pastors and their families who wanted to get away out from under the microscope. That's when Ruthie says people started asking questions about the cows. So we had people coming. I was milking the cow over here tied to a post on the side of the hill along this fence line here, that one that's coming down where the sheep are, kind of comes down behind the fodder house, and there was just a post, and they were like, they'd wander down from up at the house, and like, can I milk the cow? I was like, uh, probably not. But, and then I started, you know, me thinking right away, what does it take to milk the cow on the farm? You know, like, what would that look like? Ultimately, the vision she developed then, after many conversations with other farm stays around the country, is what it looks like now. A homestead farm sitting on an Ozark hillside near the Buffalo River, where people from all over the country come to stay at the guest house, participate in farm chores like milking cows and feeding animals, hiking with ducks, collecting chicken eggs, and so on. It's an idyllic place, though not without its challenges. Things like ice storms, slow internet, COVID-19, a broken foot. Every day, every week, the Peplers must roll with the unique challenges of welcoming guests to their working farm. Even still, it's clear there's no place they'd rather be. Next time we hear from the Peplers, Ruthie will discuss the glass wall of farm stress, that overwhelming moment where you're convinced you can't do any more, and her surprisingly simple trick for getting past it. Agritourist farms like Dogwood Hills rely on public support and word of mouth to keep their operations going. Through hard work, these young farms are becoming integral to their local communities. However, the idea of the family farm as a community hub is nothing new. 
Countless small communities across the state rely on farms the same way they rely on schools or churches. This is never more true than in the aptly named Friendship, Arkansas. Hillary Trudell has the story. Fowler Bearden Farms in Friendship, Arkansas is located in a small, tight-knit community about an hour southwest of Little Rock, between Malvern and Arkadelphia in Hot Springs County. The city limit sign boasts a population of less than 200. Rachel and John Michael raise cattle, sheep, and horses while Rachel maintains a day job. I'm a county extension agent, so I work for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. So I do everything from help people look at selection of their stock. This morning I spent the day in a truck with a producer who is trying to reclaim 100 acres of pasture land and we're talking about improvements he can make so that he can turn those into grazable acres. The family started the farm and the farm is family owned and operated. My favorite thing when I was a kid, some girls liked to play inside. I wanted to go feed cows with my dad. I've always enjoyed it. I went with my dad as much as I could. I wound up going to college at SAU in Magnolia, and I was an ag science major down there. And then when my husband and I got married, going on eight years ago, I was lucky this is what he wanted to do, and he knew this is where I wanted to be, so this is what we're doing. Through her work, Rachel is exposed to new techniques and technology. And one of the things, and this is where my dad and I kind of butt heads every once in a while, is with my day job, I'm exposed to all the latest technology, all the newest research-based practices. And when I come home and want to try new things, I always get that skeptic look of, well, that's not how we did it. And sometimes our new way's not the better way, but I'm not afraid to try those things that are new. Rachel is a sixth generation farmer, and while John Michael has farming in his background, he says it skipped a generation. It's truly striking how many hats they both wear. While farming is incredibly labor intensive, having so many people in the community willing and able to help out allows them to give back in other ways. After this, you're going to Little Rock to the Farm Bureau. Women's Conference. And so that's one of the things that this conference does is it brings women together from all across the state in different aspects. I chair our local women's committee. John Michael is an officer on our county board. John Michael serves as a voting delegate and does some other things. It's taking your personal ideas and in my case I try to think one step farther of the other guys around me that are my age trying to start the things here recently has been the meat processing with the meat prices jumping through the roof there's been a big push for more meat processing facilities well that started on the county levels Rachel and John Michael are living proof of the hard work that goes into these essential professions more recently, though, John Michael has been able to work the farm full-time while Rachel keeps her day job. Before he came home full-time, we were primarily flashlight farmers because we both worked 8 to 4.30 or 5 in the evening, and then you get home and you have all these cows to feed and things to check and things like that. So him being home full-time where he can do most of the feeding during the day has made a huge difference. I was a teacher at Malvern High School. Absolutely loved it, but this grew to a point where it required enough of us that one of us was going to have to do something. Probably been one of the hardest yet best decisions I've ever made. And when I say the hardest, it's hard to leave security, it's hard to leave a paycheck, it's hard to leave your kids. I mean, you get attached to your coworkers and the people that you're, you're dealing with and you've built your life around. The farm operates as a kind of community hub where the Bearden Farm family and neighbors can come and learn about the practice. There are always kids around and Rachel is glad to have them. Children can come and learn and keep out of trouble by having something productive to do and as Rachel says, stay fed. But I'm glad we can be the cool place for kids to hang out because if they're here, they're not getting in trouble. They're learning something, they're learning work ethic if nothing else. But as idyllic as it can seem, there are always unseen stresses waiting around the corner. You know, even if we go on vacation, that means there's got to be this many other people there to help pull our load. Mm -hmm. If it is Christmas morning, you've still got chores to do because animals still have to be fed. Because the farm does have to come first. You can't leave the ox in the ditch. You've got to handle what has to be handled because these are live animals and we owe it to them. It's hard to plan. It's hard to balance that. If you're trying to be just in the hay business, that's only a summer paycheck, you know, and being able to balance everything and growth and then... You know, last year's prices, we were at $20 a roll on on 
two dollar a gallon diesel and now we're going to be facing five dollar a gallon diesel how do you even budget that and it's the same fight all small business owners are in i don't care if you're a restaurant owner who's having to go up on your chicken prices because we were talking to one of the local places that we frequent his chicken prices have doubled this year but he hasn't raised his menu price because he doesn't want to hurt his consumers but at the end of the day it's all worth it this is what this is about you get to look out and see a hard day's work but the satisfaction that I get, I can come bring a rocker chair over here and I can sit and rock and look out and think, man, God is good. God has been so good to us. One day there'll be a house right here. There will be. When we catch back up with Rachel and John Michael next month, they'll be taking shelter from a storm. John Michael will discuss how down fences and stranded cattle mean caring for your neighbor's farm as well as your own. And the extra cost of community. Established farms like Fowler Bearden or Lakeview Farms in East Arkansas have decades of family knowledge to help manage their day-to-day -day operational stress. But every season, countless new farmers take the plunge. They often spend their first few seasons learning the ropes. Our next farm in West Fork, Arkansas, knows that success is just a combination of creativity and determination. Antoinette Grajeda has the story. Larry Galligan is the owner of Riverside Specialty Farm, a young operation in Washington County. With his wife at work and his nine-year-old son at school, he's spending the day surrounded by the family's furry companions, a friendly black and white cat named Clover and a large, excitable, dark gray dog named Pepper. <laughs> Pepper. I'll let her out so she can say hi in a minute. Adopted during the pandemic, Pepper is a one-and-a-half-year-old mutt who's used to being around her human during the day. Spending time with four-legged creatures is familiar for Galligan, who grew up on his parents' ranch in Clinton, Arkansas. His folks ran the local cell barn for a time, and they still maintain their cattle operation today. Despite his upbringing, Galligan found himself more interested in plants than livestock. What's cool about vegetables is vegetables can still die, but they can't run away. The 43-year-old says he's always been a big gardener. His family had a large garden, and while it didn't always do well, he found tending the plants interesting and fun as a teenager. After college, he moved back home to work for his parents for about a year and a half. He started gardening during this time just to give himself something to do. It was really enjoyable and gave me a way to kind of relax at the end of the day, and so I just kind of continued that through my adult life. Galligan pursued a master's degree in entomology at the University of Arkansas and stayed in Fayetteville when he found a job on campus. He started developing his farm in West Fork on the side in 2017. When his U of A job ended in 2020 due to a colleague's retirement, Galligan decided to take the leap to full-time farm life. Overall, we're 17 acres. We have about two acres that we use for our growing area, but even all of that is not all under cultivation. We have... Uh, one high tunnel, we have a second high tunnel that's being put up right now, and then we have five other main growing blocks. Galligan grows a variety of produce, and some of this year's crops are still in seed packets piled on his tall wooden dining table. But then um, we've got some chard there too, green chard. We've got beets and um, Mayan jaguar lettuce, which is one of my favorites. It's really pretty, it's got spots on it. Other crops have already been planted and are sprouting. Galligan says he likes to start as many plants as possible, and direct seeding is not preferred, with few exceptions. Over here is where we have broccoli and greens and cabbages uh, starting, uh, some lettuce as well. And so what's nice is this week I can pull all this, these plants out of here and start hardening them off because it's not getting real cold at night. And so... The problem is, is my greenhouse is really small. And so next year, if we're gonna keep doing this, I gotta get a bigger heated greenhouse. Galligan built the 18 by seven foot structure by hand. The greenhouse, along with a high tunnel and five growing blocks surrounded by an eight foot tall deer fence are located in the backyard. Railroad tracks divide the property, which is bordered on the eastern side by the west fork of the White River and Highway 71. It's too complicated to pump water from the river across the railroad tracks, but Galligan does have access to a small stream on the north side of his backyard. They ran out of water for the first time in 2021, so Galligan has acquired a unique reservoir for this year. 
water worries me a little bit. And so, uh, so hopefully our above ground swimming pool that we got from our neighbor will help store enough to kind of get us through some lean times. Um, so yeah, no, over, overall I've, I'm feeling pretty good, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely feeling a little anxious because I've got myself already overcommitted. In addition to farming, Galligan builds fences, but he's trying to wrap up those projects before the growing season gets too hectic. While he works mostly on his own, he hopes to find someone who can help him with farm work part-time. I learned in 2020 that having help was definitely crucial. And so, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot we can do ourselves, And as long as you make a list at the beginning of the day and try to uh, stick to it, if you can accomplish 75% of what's on your list, you're doing pretty good, you know, it's, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot. With worries of freezing temperatures, temperamental seedlings, and dwindling water reserves, Galligan's two-acre high tunnel operation isn't nearly as relaxing as working the garden on his parents' ranch. He's quickly learning that less acreage doesn't equate to less stress. But when it's time for a break, Pepper's always there with a wagging tail and ears, eager for a scratch. With a swimming pool of water reserves and a second high tunnel on the way, Larry Galligan is doing all he can to soften the learning curve of being a new farmer. Next month, Larry will reflect on a piece of advice he recently received from an old timer. Farming without risk ain't farming. And just how that applies to almost losing his entire tomato crop to pest and disease. The stress of managing a successful operation that doesn't dissolve with experience. Will Norton, who's been raising his own cattle since he was 13, knows just as your farm grows and changes, so does the stress that comes with it. Here's Jordan Hickey. Will Norton has a small farm in his garage. He opens the door leading from the family's kitchen out into the garage, and there it is. A full-scale cattle operation and heavy metal miniature spread across the floor. Well, there's a feed truck that's got a feed box on it, a little bell bed on it. I don't know. It's as uh, big as a shoe box. It's made out of real heavy steel. It can't be tore up. There's a horse trailer there with living quarters in it. And then there's a little uh, half-top catch trailer. Will and his wife, Rachel, got the setup from a custom toy maker from Happy Texas with a little help from Santa for their two kids, Whitley and Cal. It's all but indestructible as far as toys go. It's also not all that different from the Norton's actual farm, albeit on a smaller scale in every sense of the word. On his farm just outside Harrison, Will Norton might turn around 2,500 to 3,000 stalkers a year, which are calves between six and nine months, and 400 to 700 pounds. He's got a few people who graze them, and he'll pay for however much weight is gained. Some he'll keep for six months, some he'll hold for up to 14 if they're grazing lightweights. But there's more in the garage than just toys. Saddles, a horse-drawn buggy, the trailer slash camper that they'll be taking tomorrow for a much needed vacation. And then there's the tractor. That tractor was bought in 47, the same year my dad was born. Really? My granddad bought it, yeah. I bought it off of dad. Oh, the motor locked up in, I brought it in here, worked on it, and I never have finished. We'll get it going, it's just no tricycle H. Not really worth much, but when I was a kid, for my birthday, Dad used to start that up. When we go out there, big wide spot in front of the barn there, you could step on one break and it'd just sit there and make a circle. That's what uh, that was what my birthday present was, I guess. But uh, we, we were pretty poor growing up. And then uh, I started raking hay on that tractor when I was pretty young, and uh, I don't know how old I was, six, seven. That was roughly around the time Will decided that he was going to be a farmer. Or as he puts it, that's when it became clear that he couldn't be anything but a farmer. I remember my mom begging me to go to school and do anything but farm, and I thought the end of the world was there. I had no reason to live after that. <laughs> Farming, after all, was in his blood. The Nortons have worked in agriculture in some capacity or another going back three generations. 
but as Will says, that's changed over the years. There, my dad was in agriculture. I got an uncle that was in the generation before that. I can't remember, there was five or seven of them. They was all in agriculture except for one, he was a doctor. And uh, anyways, so went from whatever that was, I'd have to really think that, <laughs> that generation, I never knew any of them, they was like seven and then went down to two, and then now one. There are lots of reasons why farm families like the Nortons have seen their numbers on the land begin to dwindle. At least one of them is this. It's not easy work. Even though things are different now from when Will first started out, when he was driving a mail truck, logging, and working in sale barns, back when he was still renting his dad's land and was living in an unheated house, he still got zero illusions about the challenges farming poses. It's tough work, and it's not something that you can realistically undertake by yourself. No, and I'm not that big of an operation. There's a lot bigger ones, but it's... Uh, if you try and do it all, I don't feel like most of them people are very successful. Um, I'm not saying that I am, but they're tired. They're... You know, you can't be the guy that's um, cleaning the chute and hauling the cattle all night long and then being there at six in the morning starting the feed trucks and, you know, it's just it's exhausting. You get where you don't even want to do your job, so. And so Will manages that balancing act, the same as countless other family farms, working to be big enough to remain profitable but small enough to protect your own health and well-being. Just like the miniature farming operation in his garage, Will knows you've got to be built tough to make it as a farmer. But there's nothing he'd rather be doing, no matter the size or scale. Next month, we'll find Will and his family growing their operation the old-fashioned way, bottle-feeding calves on their back lot. Will will discuss how, as with most farmers, keeping his stock healthy is sometimes an easier task than managing his own health. Smaller farms, like the Nortons, as well as the others we're featuring, aren't much different than small businesses. Every season offers a chance to grow in size and profit, but the growth means more work and more stress, and it's a hard line to walk. Darren Davis, a row crop farmer in Phillips County, Arkansas, has been walking that line for 32 seasons now. He's learned that when a late winter storm blows your way, take cover. On a cold, cloudy winter day with a snowstorm on the way, there's not much work Darren Davis can do on his Phillips County farm. Instead, he's sitting on a couch in the living room of his Lakeview home, watching the Arkansas Razorback men's basketball team take on LSU in the SEC tournament. This college game is really, oh my goodness. Davis loves basketball. He played in high school and turned down a few college scholarships so he could attend Arkansas State University, where he studied agricultural economics, which has supported his first love, farming. Wouldn't rather do anything else. I mean, absolutely, positively think, in my opinion, that I was born to do this. Davis's grandfather farmed family land, and when he died, Davis's father took over. He had to borrow money against the farm, which he eventually lost. So Davis started from scratch and rented his first 40 acres in 1990. More than 30 years later, he's the owner of Lakeview Farm, which includes approximately 1,600 acres. It consists of uh, soybeans, cotton, corn, rice, uh, some edible peas or yellow peas, as they're called. Occasionally, some purple hull peas. Uh, some wheat sometimes. So we grow pretty much every row crop that you can grow. Davis has worked more land, but says 1,500 to 1,600 acres is a sweet spot that gives him time to participate in activities outside of farming, like spending time with family. Davis and his wife have five children, and he is the proud papa of four grandbabies, another love of his life. The 53-year-old is also in his second term as Lakeview's mayor. When the previous mayor unexpectedly died shortly before the 2014 election, Davis was asked to step up. I tell people, even to this day, that I'm not a politician. <laughs> but 
I, I love running the city because I was born and raised here, been here all of my life. And uh, I've been farming for, I think this is my 32nd season. And uh, so I wasn't going anywhere. So to run the city was just, it was a privilege. It was a privilege to even be asked. So, and to this day, it's still a privilege. Lakeview was established during the Great Depression as part of a rural resettlement program and today has 327 residents, 93% of whom are African American. The town was one of three Arkansas communities reserved for black families like Davis's ancestors who received farmland. However, African American farmers have faced barriers to success, including racial discrimination from agencies like the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who has launched an equity commission to address this issue. Davis says his family has had problems with the USDA's Farm Service Agency for decades, and he's seen no sign of improvement. There's some horrific things that have gone on with FSA in my life. And my dad has told me stories that you would not believe that has gone on with FSA in his day. Not having equitable access to FSA loans can prevent black farmers from purchasing land. Davis says he often encounters bidding wars where instead of agreeing to the sale, the landowner entertains higher offers, often from white farmers with more resources that Davis can't compete with. We try to keep it as quiet as we can when we're trying to purchase land, but when the word gets out, it's, we know, okay, we're going to be outbid it. So it kind of, it's frustrating, but it is what it is. Davis says it's common for African-American farmers to rent land. He owns about 100 acres and rents the rest, but hopes to buy more in the near future. Davis's long-term goal is to pass the farm on to his family. He wants to teach them the importance of not selling the land because it's so difficult to acquire. I've set up trust so it can't be barred against and that kind of thing. And I'm trying to teach them how to pass it down from generation to generation and keep it in the family. That's my plan. Now, they say if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. (laughs) So that's my plan. That's my plan. After three decades, Davis knows there's only so much planning you can do in farming. Weather is always a big unknown. This year, he's also worried about the cost of weed killer, which is five times more expensive than last year. However, experience has taught him you just have to deal with challenges as they come. It goes back to what my dad says. Just don't worry about the things you can't control. And it took me, don't think this happened overnight. (laughs) It did not. Uh, You can see gray head. (laughs) It didn't happen overnight. But I would say within the last seven, eight years, it doesn't bother me anymore. I just kind of take it with a grain of salt. No take gets it in. Amude throws it up. That is huge. The April soil will still be too wet to plant in Phillips County next month. Add a broken pull behind sprayer to the equation, and Darren Davis's spring might be heading off the rails. Whether it's the immediate problems like the staggering cost of herbicide or the challenge of maintaining personal relationships, one thing is clear. Arkansas farmers, regardless of scale or experience, are struggling. And few people understand this struggle better than Arkansas Secretary of Agriculture, Wes Ward, who stays motivated in his mission with one simple question. Why is agriculture important? Arkansas PBS producer Corey Womack spoke with Secretary Ward in Conway. We're talking with Arkansas Agriculture Secretary Wes Ward. Such an honor to have you here in the studio today, you know, and we were tasked with kind of highlighting agriculture in Arkansas. And so it was definitely our Department of Agriculture working with the USDA that that kind of got us this grant to get started. So yeah. kind of tell us a little bit about the grant, the the Farm Ranch Stress yeah. Relief. We, we participate in the, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, and there was an effort made to just to recognize the stress that producers and in the industry is, is facing. And from that standpoint, the State Departments of Agriculture, basically we're asking USDA, like we, we need broader support for mental health and asked for State Departments of Agriculture to be able to assist in, in providing that to our own respective states and industry. And so that was a successful effort. You know, USDA announced the grant and we, we applied for it and was able to secure funding. And it's not just Arkansas. So, I mean, Arkansas PBS is doing, you know, we're doing our podcast, we're doing a couple of broadcast projects, but there are a couple of other organizations that, that receive some funding. 
funding from this grant as well. That's right. right. So we worked with, you know, certainly Arkansas PBS, our sales from the Department of Agriculture is involved, the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture is involved. We're, we're glad to, to be a part of that grant and glad that y'all are part of this process and just looking forward to what y'all are going to do over the podcast series. It's important uh-huh. and we appreciate you being a part of that. So we'll kind of switch gears. And so where I grew up and historically, I, I feel like Arkansas was mostly family farms. Yep. Is that still true? You know, demographically, yep. what does farming look like? Yeah, so it's uh, it's over 97% of the of the farms and agriculture production in Arkansas is still family, family owned, family operated businesses. So okay. it's the sizes have changed. There's certainly larger farms and larger operations, but it's still very much a family, family oriented uh, industry. Yeah, one of our families that were following us, he's kind of talking about, well, when my dad did it, yeah. we were half the size I am today. And he, yeah. it kind of started echoing that phrase of get big or get out, which yeah. I know has, has been prevalent in farming for sure. me. So where did that yep. kind of idea come from? So I, I think that's been around for a little while and, and not surprising. You know, I, I think it's whether it's agriculture or any other sort of business, you just have just basic economics and where, you know, you have economies of scale, you have, you know, if you buy in bulk, you get larger discounts. A lot of the family farms would have, would have liked to have stayed at the same size, but you know, just recognizing the profit and loss aspect of business and, and you know, talking about farm stress, I think that's one of them, whether it's a smaller scale or the other end on the larger scale, you know, sometimes uh, the operations can be very labor intensive. We also kind of hear reference to this farming crisis of the 80s. Yeah. Sometimes we hear guys say, man, this reminds me of what my dad went through. And then I've heard some older guys go, man, this ain't nearly as bad as as the farming crisis. So what was the farm? What kind of crisis was that? Uh, What happened in the 80s? Certainly, that's you know certainly b- before my time as well. But certainly, hear a lot about that as well. Still, to your point, a lot of producers still generationally still speak about the '80s and the mm-hmm. impact it had, and and that's caused some to be better farmers. And, you know, just those history lessons that were learned there, either from you know individually or from from their parents or grandparents that lived through that, and uh, lessons learned there. But certainly, a lot of the same factors that we're seeing a little bit today. Right. You know, it's you know, in- inflation, higher cost of you know the inputs involved in and production agriculture all those were were high debt was high Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't seen the debt side as much now in modern times as what what happened in the 80s but certainly a lot of debt that was that was one of the land values high debt high 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 input costs all those inflation all those things and we see some of that today which is which is what has caused a lot of people like uh are we are we about to see another (laughs) is it gonna happen to us again or not we may have you back True. at the end yep. of the podcast. Like yep. I said, we're going to do 10 episodes. We're going to kind of follow these yeah. folks for 10 months and kind of get an idea of what a year of farming looks like. I, you know, I, I think it's just so incredibly important. And I ask the rhetorical question a lot. It's like, well, why is it important? Why is agriculture important? And and some people kind of look it's like, I don't know. Why, I don't, I don't, why is it important? It's like, well, did you eat today? Right. It's like, did you, like, what, you know, do you have clothes on today? Right. It's like, yes, we do. It's like, and what provides that? It's, it's the agriculture agriculture industry and so right. especially for for the United States as a whole but for for Arkansas it's a, you know it's our, our state's largest industry 19 billion dollar economic impact every year broad range of agriculture production even just look at the the land of, of Arkansas you know 97 percent of that is in agriculture and forestry and you know three percent is, is where your cities and towns are the, <laughs> everything else is agriculture right. and forestry and so incredibly important to our state and making sure that the, those those producers in the industry that provides that food, fiber, fuel, and shelter that we depend on every single day can continue to do their job and provide that for us every single day is, is just incredibly important. Food, fiber, fuel, and shelter. With those four words, Secretary Ward simplifies why agriculture is important, not just to Arkansas, but for the entire planet. Farmers in Arkansas and across the country are the caretakers, and they need our help. Their way of life has gotten too costly. So why is it important? Well, that's the question we're here to answer. Next month, we'll catch back up with our six featured farmers and see how they survived the tornadoes that struck the state in early April. 
We'll also speak with Dr. Teresa Hudson of the PRI Center for Health Research at UAMS about the effects long- and short-term stress have on farmers. The growing season is funded through a farm and ranch stress assistance network grant provided by the United States Department of Agriculture and administered by the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. This episode was written and directed by Corey Womack of Arkansas PBS. Our stories are covered by Antoinette Grajeda of Arkansas Got Soul, journalist Jordan Hickey, as well as Hillary Trudell, Omaya Jones, and Andy Vaught of the Yarn Storytelling Initiative. This podcast is an Arkansas PBS production. I'm your host, Ben Dickey, and this has been The Growing Season.